I just sent you an invitation to Rob, so. Finally. How are you? Sorry. I'm nervous. Why I'm nervous? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Do I need to call you Dr. Uriarte? I, mean, I need a cardiologist. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be fine. We've done this before. <laughs> don't touch your hair. I have a friend that she tells me that every time that I'm on the live, I'm all the time touching my hair. And then she tells me always pictures of me touching my hair. It's because you have it. Be happy. I'm happy that I still have hair. That we have. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So I'm going to introduce to João Loredo, which uh, obviously I've been practicing again. I know you for already how many years? 11, 12? Yeah, 11 yeah. years probably. But yeah. we had a full um, train trip of about one hour trying to say your name properly. <laughs> you remember with Sarah Jane? That's right. And that was uh, Juan. An 11, Juan. Was it? Juan. 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 <laughs> Seven years later, we still have... We still can do it. No, no. So, um, so Juan, he's a clinician in a referral practice in the UK uh, who has been working for many, many years. But he's also on the board committee for the examination for the uh, European College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Cardiology. So you've been doing that for many years now? Four or five years, yeah, yeah. But you also like uh, teaching a lot. You do enjoy a lot, obviously, all the interns you have uh, over there, but also you do a lot of CPDs. And, uh, and I think that everyone enjoys a lot your uh, teaching. Yeah, it's really good so fun. I'm sure that a lot of students will like you to be in their university with them. I'm, I'm happy where I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you know, guys, that this is for you to ask questions. So we're going to start with some questions. And um, I think that the first probably question, that most important thing will be, uh, can you show us what does a, a collapsing, how does a collapsing dog behave? What, what, how would you, how would do you represent a dog that is collapsing? Do you want me to collapse here? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> That's my favorite part, that what I ask owners to do, but you're not going to get me to do it. I know that. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, let's, let's, let's start being serious. This, uh, this is a relaxed talk. I'll do it after you. You do yeah. an epileptic and I do... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when we post the, the Instagram videos, I think that a lot of people were very good already um, asking the right questions. So now what would be the questions? But... Um, do you want to, let's, why don't we say, you say the most common things that it will make, kind of make your dogs collapse or mm, fit, mm, mm. and then I will say it, and then we'll try to work together how we can yeah, yeah, yeah. differentiate yeah. and or how could we mistake one, one episode with the others. And, and I think, I think that that's a really good way to start because we can, we can talk about why, for instance, why does a, a cardiac patient collapse? Why would he have this? So we're talking about the collapsing dog. We're not talking about the patient that is collapsed and is presented like in shock. We're talking about the, the dogs that have an episode, have yeah. whatever the owners will then describe it. And we know that they call it completely different things. Like, I don't know, I don't know if you feel that in America things are different, but like, if you remember in the UK, I think people call a faint if they think that there was a loss of consciousness. Yeah. They call it collapse if the dog just goes down And then they call it a fit if they think that there's like movement. And uh, we kind of get need to get used to it. And, and I don't know, I mean, it took me a while to yeah. understand what people were saying. Well, why, well, the, oh, no, he didn't collapse. He only fainted. And you're like, well, I, I don't really know what you mean. So I think it's quite difficult, that description. And I don't know, like in Portuguese, people would say, desmaio as a, as a fainting, yeah. convulsão. As if yeah. like they were having a fit. I'm not sure if in Spanish they in Spanish is the same. Words. Yeah, desmayar yeah. o convulsionar. Sí. O convulsion. And collapse, collapse. I don't. I don't think people in Portugal would no. use Portuguese would use collapse. So I don't think they would use. No, that. in Spanish we wouldn't say a collapsado. No. That would be like the the I don't know building has collapsed or maybe yeah, like yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. a bank absolutely. has collapsed or something. That's like that, right. Yeah. Financially, absolutely, absolutely. So I think syncope. Is, is a weird one that people, and I think we medics use it more than anyone else. Yeah. I don't normally get owners said, oh, we had a syncopal episode. It, yeah, that's yeah. us. Um, but often fainting and collapse, you probably hear more the fits. I we hear, hear less of the seizures. And I think that, I mm. think that uh, 
a lot of owners will call a seizure what it could be also a single. Oh, 100%. 100%. Particularly yeah. if, if there's a little bit of movement when the animal is, when, when, when the dog is waking up, they're like, oh, yeah, he does this with the, and he's just trying to stand up. Absolutely, absolutely. So for, 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 to your question, why does a cardiac patient collapse? Well, it collapses because the heart, for one reason or another, and we can discuss that a little bit more, um, the heart is unable to provide enough blood to the brain to maintain consciousness. Okay, so it is something that stops the heart from working and having a cardiac output that will provide to the muscles and to the brain enough, enough oxygen. And then he faints, which I think is probably the more common description that I have. He fainted. Yeah, and that's exactly why actually this presentation makes sense, because at the end of the day, we have the discussion, what is more important, the brain or the heart? Absolutely, the heart, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> If the heart is not pumping to the brain and the muscles, then we're going to have something that it could look potentially neurological because at the end of the day, the end that product is going to be this nervous system. Absolutely, absolutely. The hypoxia, isn't it? And, and that's something that we see a lot, that, that opistotonous posture that we see with the patients with, with a, a cardiac collapse. I mean, that is because of brain hypoxia, isn't it? And, and they will have sometimes a bit of a, of a tonic-clonic waking up and the yeah. posture of the opistotonus, which we see a lot. We see a lot. We see a lot. But the, the typical cardiac collapse, I think, would be, and I think we've discussed that a lot, I think would often be more of a flaccid, so they faint, so they yeah. lose consciousness. I think it depends on the level of severity, but I often expect a cardiac patient to lose some degree of consciousness. So I normally use that. Does this the, is very important. Yeah. Does the head of the patient touch the floor? And if you're fainting, the head of the patient touches the floor. Even if he then regains consciousness, the patient would have a, a it goes down smoothly sometimes, and then the, 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 the head would touch the floor, and then you would have a recovery. And that for me, and I remember we discussed this a lot, the recovery for me, it's super important. Because the cardiac patient, when it faints, I mean, the reality is, the unfortunate reality is, if it lasts very long, that patient may pass away. Okay, there's one exception, which is the pericardial effusion, because if the patient has a pericardial effusion, the recovery may be longer. But the more typical, like arrhythmia type of, of syncope, I really expect the patient, once the heart starts beating, he's back to normal. And he doesn't, doesn't really understand what happened there, because he's now, blood pressure is back to normal, brain is getting all the blood that it needs, the body feels great, and they feel completely normal. Yeah. But I, I do think that, that um, there are some exceptions. The pericardial diffusion is the, is, the, is, the, is the tricky one that they can linger a little bit more. Yeah, I did have a case. I have a one question from Guido that I'm going to ask you in a second. But go, 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 I do go. have a very good example of a case that was, I think that you remember this white boxer that was referred to us for seizures under seizure treatment. So then obviously the dog already came a little bit ataxic and, and right. actually the dog, do you remember, that has a, a, a tumor in the base of the heart, so it had a pericardial right. effusion. So yeah. these seizures that we never saw, no. they were actually these uh, collapses. Good. T tell me the question then, because that may lead us yeah. to something else. So, um, yeah, Guido was asking if, they, if you could have a collapse of a cardiac origin without having that loss of consciousness. That yes. Yes, yes. They, they come in multiple forms. For instance, like, um, let's talk about probably one of the most important. So if you don't mind, Annie, I'll, I'll, I'll drive you just, uh, I'm sure that most people that follow you are more neurologically driven. So, so I probably, I probably will, will try. When I'm thinking of a, a patient, cardiac patient collapsing, I'm thinking of three conditions. One is arrhythmias, either fast or slow, tachycardia, ventricular or supraventricular, or sinus arrest, third degree V block. So either fast or slow. Yeah. If the heart is either not beating or beating so fast that it can't produce an output, the patient will faint. The second group, so arrhythmia, the first one, the second group will be the pericardial effusion. So the cardiac tamponade that you were describing. If the pressure created by the fluid around the pericardium collapses the right atrium, nothing pumps. And the patient will then, in a period of high demand, so during when he's excited or needs more, more yeah. cardiac output, will not provide it and he will collapse. And then the last one, more difficult, will be hypoxia. So pulmonary hypertension and those weird kind of cardiac cases like um, tetralogies of fallow or reverse PDA or double chamber right ventricle, which create hypoxia. But basically, if the brain, if the heart is not able to pump oxygenated blood into the brain, you're going to have a feature, you're going to have a seizure or you're going to have a fainting during times of high demand. So 
particularly with the arrhythmias, to your question, they come in very different shapes. I mean, a very short period of ventricular tachycardia will not create a collapse. You and I, we wouldn't pick it up. We pick it up on the whole time. A short period, let's say three, four seconds of sinus arrest, no heartbeats. You probably won't pick it up unless the patient is running, needing a lot yeah. of cardiac output. And yeah. so once you start talking to the owners, they often come back to you and go like, actually, I thought he was just losing his foot, but he's actually having small ones. So yes, you can have small ones and then you can have the big ones like slap in the face that the owner has time to get the camera and get a recording for you. And those would be the ones that would have a proper fainting head on the floor and then somewhat a period of recovery. But um, the cardiac episode, yeah, I, I don't think lasts very long. Yeah, I think that that little short ones that you described is one of the videos that we post on the Instagram when you have this bull terrier that was just losing a little bit the back legs. It's just that like was a walking VTAC. and then... Perfect, perfect. That's a VTAC yeah. with a patient with aortic stenosis. So the aortic stenosis drops your cardiac output. So a little bit of VTAC shows itself more. And those were just the tiny little ones. So he's just, blood pressure is dropping a little bit and then it stops and he reaches normal consciousness. If that VTAC was to be continued for a couple more minutes, that patient would potentially then have a full collapsing episode yeah. or a full sink. Mm. Yeah, and I think that this is extremely important what Joao was saying at the beginning, that we are talking about the collapsing episodes, not the dog mm, that mm, comes mm. down, what we say in the States, the dog that cannot move. And for example, this little bull terrier that we saw on the Instagram, um, if this w could be, like in neurology we'll be thinking, could that be a problem in the back? If it was a problem in the back, this would be happening all the time when he's trying to go upstairs, when he's trying to run, um, not just like one second and then he's walking like normal. And if, for example, you think could be a vestibular episode that the dog is losing a little bit the balance, again, it wouldn't last two seconds. It's no, going to last no, much no. longer. And you're going to have his you're also going to have a head tilt. You're going to have some ataxia in the front limbs. You, so this shortness of the episode and obviously what the dog was doing, but I think that the cardiac, you do have that presentation of completely normal patient and then having this episode that if you only look at the video, it could look like anything. Anything, anything, yeah. You, you, you need to open possibilities. And also the other things that, a question that I ask a lot of my owners is that, so they describe, you know how they, they like to describe the episode and we yeah. want, we need to let them describe the episode. Um, it's a very stressful event. They need to come and have a chat. If not, you're not going to have a chance to auscultate the patient because they will still be talking whilst you're trying to auscultate. So you need to let them speak. You need to let them tell what it happened. But the, the question that I ask a lot is that once they've finished describing, I said, okay, so now let's wait five, 10 seconds. If I was to look at him now, would I be able to tell that he's just had an episode? And the vast majority of cardiac ones, unless the exception is the pericardial effusion because it lasts a little bit longer, but the typical cardiac episode Five seconds after, as soon as the heart's beating fine, as soon as the blood gets oxygenated and goes into the brain, he's completely normal, completely normal. Whilst yours, I don't think that that would be the case. Would that be No, no, exactly. Yeah. And then this is what we were saying. And I think that this, we could continue living on that respect mm. because talking about, for example, atonic seizures, a seizure is likely to have a postictal phase. And then, right. so when the owner, when you're going to look at the dog 10 seconds, five seconds after the episode happened, the dog is not going to be normal. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that we have, autonomic signs. So what do you think? Would you record some autonomic signs in your cases? I think it's, it's rare. I think it's rare. So um, we, we have the big ones, the big episodes, the patient may have lost sphincter control, so they may urinate. But that's about it. Uh, I don't see any, because you, you normally used to ask me a lot whenever we, we discuss this case and you would describe, yeah. you would you'd say that that's a very important thing for you, wouldn't you? Yeah, it will be on the general seizures, which I guess that yeah. also the big tri trick here will be, yeah, we have a generalized seizures versus a cardiac uh, collapse. Probably we have that not postictal phase, autonomic signs. We're talking about a partial seizures. I think that guys, seizures they also tend to last a little bit longer than a cardiac collapse and usually it tends to be more like a, a kind of repetitive and a synchronic movements of whether the you, eyes you mentioned or the that. face I, rem I remember that you mentioned that with some of the the ones that you that we were looking together you said there's a certain rhythm to that tonic movement and you yes. describe that to be speech. yes mm. which i, I think don't, that I is don't see that. exactly and i think mm. that you need to mm. see guys uh, one of the videos that we post also on instagram there is 
this dog that he has the collapse and tries to get up. And it seems a little bit what Joan was saying, a little bit of paddling, a little bit of pistotonus, but it's not rhythmic. It's just the dog trying to get up from being a little bit weak. So you need to look for the rhythm when you're thinking about a, a seizure. How if the paddling it's is really that movement. It's interesting. I, I don't know if you do that. I, I, I ignore the, the, the recovery, what the owners tell me a lot of times, because it's very subjective. Like some, even between people, and I'm sure you've had that, and I love to listen yeah. to different people's uh, opinion. So you yeah. listen to what the mom says, what the dad says, and then finally there's a kid that has three movies of it in the phone and they won't tell you. But, but <laughs> those, are the, <laughs> those are probably the ones that you should be looking. But I normally don't give a lot of, a lot of attention to the recovery because there's a lot of interpretation. When they say, oh, yeah, uh, yes, he was moving quite a lot. It looked like he having a fit. I, I, I care more about five seconds later or 10 seconds later, how does it look? Like, would I be able to come yeah. into the room and go, he's just had something happened? Or is he completely back to normal? The only one, like I'll say it again, the pericardial effusion, they can last for longer. It can be short, but if the, if the right atrium is tamponade, um, or if that patient is experiencing a bleeding into the pericardial sac, that one will last a lot longer. You're absolutely right. But yeah. that one, I hope that that one on the physical examination, and obviously you and I, Anna, we see, Cases that have already been referred. Like, yeah. um, I don't know if you do this, but when I talk about collapsing episodes, my, my last case was a collapsing boxer. I talk about three groups of conditions. I say metabolic, so things like anemia, things like hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia. I talk about the cardiac ones, like I just said, which I would go arrhythmias, pericardial effusion, and pulmonary hypertension. And then I kind of brush through the neurological going, oh, well, the problems with consciousness and maybe problems between the brain and the muscle, because I don't want to say, yeah. say, say too much when I don't know. But those are the things that I'm, I normally kind of guide. And the vast majority of patients that I see, the bloods have already been done. So they already come. We know that this is not an anemia case. Yeah, yeah. It's not a hyper, because otherwise they'll be referred as an anemia or they'll be referred as a hyperkalemia and probably yeah, an Amazonia. Yeah. So we're talking about the cases that on the initial examination to the vet, uh, or if you're a primary clinician, when the, when the owner comes to you and your basic data, like biochemistry and electrolytes, doesn't really tell you what's going on. Yeah. So these are, and this is, this is the beauty of these cases, but also the challenging part. So on physical examination, you could go, well, I don't know what's going on because it, 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 it's not happening it, and it's not happening now. And that, and that, I think, is a very, very important thing. So we're lucky in a way that we've seen a selected group of, of patients, but I normally, I normally in those situations, I, I, I'm, I, if, if it's not been done, I'll repeat the blood, but not normally I would go straight for the heart because I, I always think that one of the main concerns of the owners is, is this fatal, okay? Yeah. And some of the cardiac changes will probably be, be, be fatal. And the, I, was, I was coming from the point of the pericardial effusion, and I think that uh, hopefully in the pericardial effusion, you may suspect it on physical examination. I, I don't know, uh, because the patient, you won't be able to feel the heartbeat as well as you would expect. You won't be able to listen to the heart. Yeah. And you may find that the jugulars would be, would be distended. So those would be on the physical examination, my clues to think this is probably a, this is probably a, um, a pericardial effusion. But they're not easy cases at all. I've, I've, yeah. been, I've, been, I've been fooled before. Yeah, no, we need to we, we need to talk a little bit about how we're going to do the diagnosis. But let's go through some questions. Go so, okay, go, Guido go. is saying, in cardio uh, cardiology, cardiological pathologies that produce syncope, do you think that congenital or acquired are a little bit more common? And would, do you find that syncope is a little bit more in young or in older dogs? That's a great question. That's a great question. So, and the point there, I said, I, I, any cardiac disease which will obviously drop the cardiac output, will predispose a patient to collapse. But I still feel, for instance, let me give you an example, a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. Of course, if that patient get already on the edge, okay, cardiac output is low. If that patient is going to develop uh, um, an arrhythmia, that patient is going to collapse a lot sooner than a patient that has no underlying disease, okay? The most typical, the, the, the more common cause for collapsing, I think in our clinic would be an arrhythmia, okay? So we see boxers with vasovagal syncopes. We see boxers with uh, ventricular tachycardias. We see um, schnauzers, westies with bradycardias, okay? So I think acquired, therefore, would be mine. We have very, mm -hmm. very rare conditions like the tetralogy of follow, like I was saying, like the... Um, the uh, um, 
pulmonic stenosis with uh, VSDs. So those are rare cases. Uh, we would probably see a few of those a, a year and those would cause collapse, but I think they are more rare. So for the question, I would say a quiet and most likely arrhythmias would be the most common cause. Okay. So we, and when would you think, what type of uh, cardiac collapse would you think that is more likely to have this uh, urinary, so this urination during the, like, relax of the sphincters? Interesting, interesting. I, I, I think it's just the one that lasts longer. Okay? The lasts longer, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, I've seen patients with pulmonary hypertension, which normally have a relatively short uh, um, uh, um, episode. So pulmonary hypertension, basically what happens, for whatever the cause may be, a thromboembolic event, uh, um, um, pulmonary interstitial fibrosis, uh, severe pneumonia, uh, infiltrative disease of the lungs, uh, the other causes that you may have, which are ma many, multiple, of pulmonary hypertension, they normally have an inducible collapse. So every time that the patient excite, uh, gets excited or exercises, you will have uh, some degree of tachypnea and potentially the, the collapse. And they can have a very short time that they are down because unfortunately, if they last very long, they may be fatal, okay? So yeah. they, 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 we would never see them because they would die yeah. suddenly. Um, and I've seen those having urination. I've seen, um, and those would be short, and I've seen long periods of collapse, for instance, like a VTAC, that they haven't lost their, their sphincter. And it may just be because the blood pressure drops enough for the patient not to feel able to stand, but not completely lose yeah, consciousness yeah, yeah, yeah. in the way that the, the sphincter will be lost. I think, I think. Yeah. Then this question, I think that it's uh, maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit later, Guido, because I think that it's a little bit of a difficult one, because it's asking what is the most, cl most common clinical sign that comes with a patient which presents with a cardi uh, cardiological syncope? I'm not sure that you have one. It is a little bit of a tricky one, no? To, is there something that makes you think? Cardiac? Physical examination? Or, or Clinical or, sign. Because... No, uh, so, so these patients, these patients, so, so I'll, I'll go, I'll go, I'll turn that around a little bit and I'll tell you the things that worry me a lot. So uh, we are seeing these cases, we're imagining we're seeing this case because it comes for a collapsing episode. So investigation of collapse. So the clinical sign would be collapse, okay? And it could be, uh, metabolic, could be cardiac, or could be neurological. The things that would worry me a lot is a severe arrhythmia, because I know that those could be fatal, okay? So that worries me a lot. The other thing that worries me a lot is if associated with a collapsing episode, you have a shortness of breath, I'm very worried. Why? Because both an arrhythmia and a severe shortness of breath would indicate that this is a very severe disease and that the patient could die suddenly. So an okay? arrhythmia, as, you, as soon as you see that the animal when it's there, you already see the arrhythmia. Would worry, would worry me a lot. So things like um, a large breed dog with a heart murmur, with a severe arrhythmia, tachycardia, potentially an atrial fibrillation, and with shortness of breath, I mean, I worry about that a lot okay. because that patient is collapsing because the complex heart disease, which I'm creating a picture of a DCM with atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure, I mean, that patient, if he's presented with a syncopal episode, that patient will have very severe heart disease yeah. and it will be difficult to maintain quality of life. Okay, let me see. I have another one that is a little bit... If a syncope occurs due to, to less blood flow in the brain, is it possible mm -hmm. that there will be some ischemic uh, lesions in the brain, particularly... Let me see if I can see the whole particularly... Oh, I don't, I don't see the rest of the question. That's a shame. Is it possible that there would be... Should I press it? Yeah, no, I yeah I cannot see uh, the rest of the question. It happened well, okay. Mine. So... Um, I think that that probably, that question, probably I could help a little bit more answering about what will be the consequence. Um, I think, well, I think, no, the reality is that it is very uncommon that we see, um, a, for example, ischemic um, or hemorrhagic strokes in the brain secondary to heart disease in dogs. Mm -hmm. In cats, we see. We are recognizing, I don't know what you think about this job, but we are recognizing, we do a lot of thromboelastography at TAPS at the moment, and we nice. are recognizing a lot of hypertensive patients That's very interesting. that they are having uh, ischemic strokes, and they, have a little, they are a little bit pro-coagulable. Uh, um, and I think that now we are, you know, we do a lot of blood pressure measurement more than I used to do, and we do a lot of really? checks. Really? Um, and, um, but... I don't, I have had some cats. I have a beautiful MRI of an hypertensive cat that it shouldn't have had mm -hmm. an MRI. 
but unfortunately mm -hmm. he, he had it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's usually we don't end up doing the MRI. No, and, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, in reversible brain damage, due to a severe um, ischemic condition, primary to a heart disease, I think that the animal will be dead first, no? That is exactly what I was going to say. So I don't think we see those because we lose the patient and the quality of life will go. So um, um, we, we never see that level, that extent of disease, because if, if the hypoxia is so repetitive and it's so severe that will cause brain damage, we would probably have that patient put to sleep on welfare grounds, I, I would think. But I think, I think it is possible. I think, I think there will have to be. Um, if, if, if the periods of hypoxia are prolonged, I suppose, and the question may, may be because of that. So would you then expect some degree of brain disease? I mean, could you even have a seizure? Yeah, but you know? the thing is that, like, what it doesn't worry too much is that I always keep saying, like, dogs and cats, they don't use the brain as we do. do. They only they use the brain stem and the cerebellum. Exactly. They are, they are extra pyramidal animals. So yeah. although we know that more ischemic lesions are uh, into the cerebellum, like at the end of the day, the, the neurons, are, the part of the brain that needs more oxygen are the neurons, is the gray matter. And obviously right. where there is more gray matter is into the cere cerebral cortex. And to be fair, the dogs and cats, they don't need it that much. So I, I agree that obviously if you have repetitive ischemic events, you're going to have a long-term chronic degenerative brain disease and you're going to have your brain that probably is the what gray matter is going to start to kind of a little bit disappear and the white matter but i'm not sure that we're going to see that as a consequence no. in no. our no, dogs no. that they live with us and go for a walk with us and that's the only that's thing right. they do in the whole day they'll function normally absolutely and we, like you say we would we wouldn't the mri would have to be done for any different reason there's a really interesting question i'll see if you see it how about seizures in pugs with severe bradycardia and that one I would take, not just specifically on pugs. Uh, pugs, in my experience, do have, because of airway disease, they can have yeah. an increased vagal tone. They also have uh, what is described as a stenosis of the bundle of his, so they can have third yeah. degree or second degree AP block. But uh, let's take this, like if you have a patient that has a bradyarrhythmia and he has seizures, and let's say that I've had a halter. We had that. Patient... Do you remember that pug, a uh, black pug That's that we right. had? That's right, which is actually in the lecture that I think we presented initially. But yeah, that yeah. one had a that one had a proper third degree AP block, didn't it? Did it seizure also? Yes, because mm. do you remember that we had the whole? T well, sorry, I, go go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It's, 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 it's exactly that case. It's exactly that case that, that you were talking. Um, I think that case was actually done with Joel. Uh, um, if I remember, I don't remember the final diagnosis of that pug. So these so. So guys, this dog, this, this dog was a pack that it would just like, uh, we had a video where he was in the park and then he would just collapse. It looked like, surely like a seizure because it was a little bit longer. But then it was always when he was exercising at the, uh, in the park. And then we had a halter. We were very lucky that we had a halter while he had one of these episodes. And he did have a bradycardia just before, no, or just after. I don't remember, but it was not, it was very short. It was not enough. We did also the MRI, we did all the investigation, and the dog ended up responding very well to the antiepileptic treatment. We couldn't find anything on, on the heart, but he had a whole So that's the key. So although we like to explain everything with one disease, they can have two, yeah. okay? There is a predisposition, and that pug will probably have some eye problem and will also have some airway problems, right? So yeah. they can happen. The key there is where the halter monitor is having owners pinpointing exactly yeah. at what time the, 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 um, the dog had, had the episode and also being critical about the halter monitor. So if you find a sinus, a sinus, pronounced sinus arrhythmia in a pug, it doesn't concern me at all. It doesn't explain a proper seizure, okay? A proper a collapsing episode with tonic-clonic movement. Yeah. So hopefully we we'll answer that. We'll yeah. answer that question. So there was also this question before, which are two questions. So one was, I don't know how much you can quick talk about the, um, ARVC in Boxer, and then the yeah, same person is, yeah. is asking about, which probably, hopefully, we're going to go a little bit about mm. how we're going to be um, working on these cases, okay? So the, how we work yeah, out the yeah, cases, yeah. we're going we're gonna to go a little bit. But do you want to say something a little bit about the Boxer? We can talk about the ARVC. So arrhythmogenic right ventricle cardiomyopathy. People have dropped the right ventricle, so we call it arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Um, you often describe it also just as boxer cardiomyopathy. It is a substitution of the myocardium for, um, 
fibrous and fatty tissue, and that fatty tissue that is mostly in the right ventricle, but it can affect other areas of the heart, is arrhythmogenic. So um, the boxes are presented in an adult face with ventricular um, tachycardias, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't present. They have one episode, they have a VTAC in the middle of the park or whatever, and they pass away. The, the disease, um, you, you need to look for um, systolic function or systolic dysfunction. So if there's an arrhythmia and the heart is weakened, um, the, the risk of sudden death is a lot higher, uh, I'm afraid. Um, and the treatment of ARVC would be control the arrhythmia with, with um, Sotolol would probably be my drug of choice. And then I try to optimize cardiac function with um, Pimovendum if you need to, if there is um, evidence of systolic dysfunction. But it is, it is a disease that we see a lot in the UK. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if, you, if you're exposed to many, many in the US. Um, and it, it is, it is, some patients do very, very well. Some patients end up passing away because their boxes, they're passing away of some other so cancer or something like that. But um, it can be fatal. It's a horrible disease sometimes, yeah. yeah. Horrible disease. So one question uh, of Guido, which I think that is a very good question and, and, and we can talk a little bit about that and I will also kind of reverse it a bit. So he's saying like, what would be the cardiac um, collapse that would make, could look like Nero? I would say that the most common cardiac disease that comes to, uh, to me still after the filter of the ER is the pulmonary hypertension. I think that I receive pulmonary hypertension cases referred as a neurology. Absolutely. Thanks God, I still recognize them. Um, what would be the, do you receive any neurology cases as a cardiologist? Yes. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think so. I think, I think the, 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 I don't know if you call it partial seizures of the petit mal, I think, I think they can be, because yeah. I, you know me, I can always like, ah, oh, no, that could be a bit of an arrhythmia. And, yeah. and, and so the ones that are not tonic clonic, uh, I, I think I think it's possible, or if they're brief, I think I probably would go. Oh, could that be just? It could just be weakened. I suppose so. I suppose I could. The the one that I think is really interesting, Anne, and I'm sure we you you, are, you we talked about it is is the myasthenia gravis, isn't it? So it's yes, the, it's the reverse PDA for yeah. us, which creates um, yeah. hind limb weakness and the myasthenia gravis for you. So this is the dog that goes for a walk and suddenly gets stiff on the back legs and needs to sit down. And the difference there is that you, for, for you, the head would be completely perfect. For me, uh, with, with a reverse PDA, you're going to have some degree of tachypnea associated with the pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, but the myasthenia, they... they it's so rare. They, they, happen, like, they don't only collapse and they are walking normally. They, they do get more sure. and more tired. So sure. I think, I really think that the only one that really, because particularly pulmonary hypertension in a pug, like mm. yeah. they, yeah, those, I think that they, well, to be fair in any dog, but um, I think that those could be the ones that they are more confused as seizure. I agree that the partial seizure, yes. they could be confused as cardiac, but then they happen a lot. So then let's go a little mm -hmm. bit. There's a lot of other questions. So we have go. one of these cases that someone is telling us that it's a seizure, but we think that it could be pulmonary hypertension, or they are telling you that it could be a heart and then, so the first thing that we're going to do, what you were saying, we do some blood work, basic blood work to mm. rule out uh, glucose, uh, obviously electrolytes, all that. And then we do our clinical examination. So from my perspective, if I do a completely, I have a completely normal neurological examination, of course, it still could have been a vestibular episode. And of course, it still could have been a seizure. It's not going to be a disc. It's not going to be a myasthenia it's because those are going to be abnormal. So I will only be left with having a vestibular episode and a seizure. So what are the mm. things that you could just examine your dog and you say, just by examining, still could be this, this, this. So then we move forward to, to our test. Do you know what I mean? Tell me, tell me. So, so um, I think, I think if so, a normal physical exam. So yeah, no because the tamponade, no okay. the tamponade yeah. you're going to recognize it. Exactly. So That's... I would expect, so... The tamponade, I would expect to have um, an, an abdominal distension if it's, if it's chronic or not, feel, be, no, not be able to feel the heart and have the jugglers there. The arrhythmia could be completely intermittent. So a physical examination does, that's normal, does not rule out VTAC and does yeah. not rule out an intermittent sinus arrest or an intermittent third degree AV block. Um, for the pulmonary hypertension, I would expect to have if you're lucky, if you have tricuspid regurgitation, I would expect to have a murmur on the right-hand side, and I would expect to have an abnormal lung pattern. But have I missed those before? 100%. I have missed it, because they, they can be. 
pulmonary hypertension is a hidden drug. We don't think about it a lot. It's a di hidden disease. We don't think about it a yeah. lot. And you need advanced echocardiography to diagnose it. So, to, so it is one that we miss it a lot. If you don't have it always in the back of your mind, like you said, you always need to think about it. I think, could it be? Could it be? Because it is a hidden, a hidden yeah. disease. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I so, hope that will help. So an arrhythmia, I would say, completely physical examination does not rule out an arrhythmia. Yeah. So we said uh, vestibular uh, seizures, normal near exam, arrhythmias uh, could have a will have a completely normal exam. So then our next step will be we said CBC chem. We we'll do a chest X-ray. With the chest X-ray, you could suspect the uh, pulmonary hypertension. You still haven't ruled out the arrhythmias. Obviously, you still haven't ruled out seizures. You still haven't ruled a vestibular episode. Then the next step we'll do a cardiac ultrasound. What are the things that you can rule out there? For me, for me, it would be crucial. So the cardiac ultrasound would be crucial. So for, for, for several reasons. So pulmonary, uh, the, the pulmonary hypertension, for sure, that's how you're going to diagnose it. It's the gold standard for diagnosing it, and you would, should be able to. You would see an enlargement of the right side of the heart, a dilation of the pulmonary artery, and if you have any uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, you will be able to pinpoint the severity. Um, you have a better chance of diagnosing an arrhythmia, okay, because you, you will be scanning that patient for half an hour, 45 yeah. minutes, how long it takes you. So you, have, you will have a, an ECG running there, and you will hopefully see the patient nervous when you start uh, the, the, the heart scan and then calming down. And sometimes you yeah. see the VPCs appearing here and there. And yeah. if I find a VPC um, in, the, in, a, in, a, in an echo, I want to do a whole time monitor, so for sure. But the other thing that's very important for me, Anna, is that, and I find it very helpful to the owners, is that if that heart structurally looks normal, if the heart muscle is strong, the chances of sudden death become massively reduced for that patient. And you can see the owners going, okay, what I want, I, I, I still want to lose him. And yeah, then yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. have a little bit more time to think about it. Yeah, okay. But an arrhythmia could still be. Could still okay, be. so we have, uh, we have done CVC chem, we have done chest mm -hmm. x-ray, we have done mm -hmm. a cardiac ultrasound. We mm -hmm. still don't know. This could be still a seizure, could be a vestibular episode. Imagine, guys, obviously you want the video from the owners and all Absolutely these questions crucial. you were saying, what was the dog doing before? What was the dog doing after? Uh, was he urinating? Did it last too long? Did it last too short? So after we do the cardiac ultrasound, um, what are we going to do? Because now it's going to be the big question. Are we going to send this dog on MRI or are we going to do a halter? So I'm going to say from my side for the MRI. The problem is that if this dog had idiopathic epilepsy, you're not going to find anything on the MRI. You can mm -hmm. do an EEG. Uh, the EEG needs to happen when the dog is having a seizure. And then I can assure you that that is not going to happen. You're not going to have a dog going home with an EEG and record the seizure. So having a normal MRI does not rule out that your dog has a seizure. If it's a partial or generalized one, particularly if it's idiopathic epilepsy. And if it's vestibular, the same. If the dog had... A vestibular episode secondary to a TIA, transit ischemic attack, you're not going to see anything on the MRI. So unfortunately, the MRI will be only to rule out that if there is a structural brain disease. If mm -hmm. you have a structural brain disease, it's a little bit more likely that your uh, neurological examination is going to be abnormal. So um, if you are hesitating, I will definitely prefer to do the what uh, Joao is going to explain right now, because the MRI, you need full anesthesia, and it's also very expensive. Absolutely. And it's just going to tell you that the brain is structurally abnormal. But it's not going to tell you yeah. what that episode was. And that's why probably we want to do... A halter monitor, for sure. For sure. A halter monitor, no, for sure. Is that what you wanted me to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's how do you... How, how do you do it? Because I know that you have 24, 48 hours, one week, yeah, uh, the yeah. so uh, iPhone I, thing. I like, yeah, so that's, I like, I like, so you can run an ECG, obviously, and, and get uh, um, an arrhythmia, but you need to pick up, you need to pick that episode to be 100% sure. And like that case that you were discussing, you actually need to know the timing of the episode. So you need compliant owners um, to be 100% sure, because the decision yeah. that you're going to take from there is very, very important. Yeah. So I think, um, I like, 48 hours, but just because the first day is quite a busy day and the dog's still returning home, it still has the monitor, they're getting used to it. I normally get the second day to be a normal day um, um, more than, than the first day, to, to be fair. So I like 48 hours. You could, you could, but you have a choice of running it. You can run also the one, the system that we use, you can run it for seven days, although you start having a bit of problems with the pads. But for the cases that, and there's something that I asked the owner said, do you think you can elicit Make the it episode? happen, yeah. 
As, if you can make it happen, we're going to do a halter monitor until we catch one. If the dog is having an episode every month, you kind of go, I mean, what are the likelihood now that I've done the yeah. bloods, the echo, everything looks normal. Uh, um, the neurologist has looked and he says, I mean, am I going to do a whole time monitor? What are the chances of getting a, a positive result from this? It's a lot lower. But if you tell the owner that it's very unlikely that your dog's going to die because the myocardium is strong, hopefully the owners will feel a bit more relaxed and they can give you more videos and then you may be able to pinpoint yeah. things a little bit more. So that buys us a bit of time. But the whole time monitor, the other thing that you can do is the event monitor. So what you were saying, there's um, a little device that you can implant under the skin. It needs a general anesthetic. Um, and that records the heart uh, um, for, for three years. And you can interrogate it like you interrogate a, a pacemaker. So uh, the dog comes in, it's, it's by a company uh, called Metronic, and you put the, the interrogator on the, on the device and you can interrogate it there. There are some artifacts with that, and it's not a perfect scenario. And I think like you say, Annie, then I, I've not used it a lot, but the iPhone ECG or other, uh, other brands probably have it too, where you can put the ECG. It will give you a bit of an idea of the recovery, but it's so important what happens before. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The, the, so I, I, have, I don't think I have yet reached a diagnosis based on one of those. Um, okay. I still rely on my halter monitors and repeat halter monitors until I feel that both myself and the owner have exhausted that option. And we either decide, look, we're not going to catch it unless this becomes more severe or we eventually catch one and it's a proper one. It's good, good, yeah, good and I think that that is a very good question. And it goes also with the question that Guido was asking about the differential mm. diagnosis. I would say that probably, guys, I think that seizures, even if they are partial, if you have quite a few, uh, quite a few videos, you're going to catch it up. But we have sometimes these vestibular episodes. I have quite a few packs doing those, which I don't know if they could be also related to some kind of changes into the blood pressure, but they do a little bit vestibular. They last long. They last maybe 20 minutes, something like that. They look very vestibular. They have once every six months um, and, or more. And, and they are tricky because there's no way you can catch them on a halter. Mm. I obviously, on these cases that I see the video and they look very vestibular, I'm pretty convinced that they look a neuro. Um, I tend to do an MRI and a CSF because I want to rule out a GME. You know that sometimes GME, you can have this waxing and waning episodes mm. and the vestibular episodes. And, and I have put a video there, guys. You have this whippet on the video. That is a GME. That is a dog that we thought, well, someone thought that it had a, a narcolepsy because the dog got very, very excited, and then he was just having a vestibular episode and falling down. So the and GMEs... Annie, yeah. I remember that. I, I thought this could be a tachycardia. So the owners arrive home, he's excited, he's yeah. over tachycardic. I, I thought that, that is the typical example. I thought, it's a subtle... It's a, <clears throat> it, could be, it, could be, it could be cardiac. Mm, that yeah. was a tough one. So, I mean, we have these tough uh, cases, but it's true that uh, particularly the ones that mm -hmm. they don't happen very often, but remember the GME sometimes can be waxing and waning. Um, so it's true that it, for me, it's very clear that it's vestibular because you have the falling down, walking towards one side. I tend to do the MRI and the CSF to rule out the GME because the GMEs can be, can be mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. tricky. But um, yeah, Sometimes I'm also now thinking if I don't have also, <laughs> now that we are, I'm, I'm really also now that also we have the three Tesla MRI, we've seen so many, so many like a mini um, ischemic events. And, and also with, I mean, we don't really know very well how to interpret the tech, you know, like this is still. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Like, it's hard. But, um, but it's a we, theory. Yeah, but, but, but we know that, uh, I mean, in humans, uh, being hypertensive and uh, being older and your blood vessels not, um, not being elastic with the chronic hypertension, it is one of the causes of uh, stroke, right? And, and just yeah, having yeah. a certain age and then you have a little arrhythmia. Age related. Then, yeah. So I think that probably maybe a lot of these cases, uh, they could be also little TIAs and then mm -hmm. just like sudden and they disappear. So they are not easy cases. They're not easy cases. That, that GME, I think we did a whole time monitor because I was convinced. And the way that the owners were describing was always on excitement. And it turned out to be that he always had that bit of absence, wasn't it? It yeah. never collapsed, but it was one excitement, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, so another yeah. option. Is it possible to have a postictal uh, phase after a syncope when they are recovering? Um, I don't think so. 
So for what cardiac? We, yeah, so what, what we, mean? Yeah, the postictal mm. phase is that phase where when the dog is recovering from the seizure, what is the typical thing that you're going to see on a postictal phase? The dog uh, is probably wagging the tail but cannot see, is walking into things, they are circling, uh, they are kind of looking around because they usually is related to them not seeing very well. So they are a little bit mm, taxi mm. crossing and walking a little bit like they don't know what's going on. Um, I don't think that you're going to see that even in a tamponade. No, no. The tamponade, the tamponade will collapse and then will just remain down. Okay, if they're aware that they probably feel that the blood pressure is low. So yes, I don't expect them to be, you know, like- They're not looking like that. No, like, no, no, the opposite. They stay down and, they, and the owner says, I thought he wasn't going to walk home. And it took him 15 minutes yeah. to be able to walk home. Okay, um, and that probably is the time that you need renin angiotensin or those system to start building up your blood pressure again yeah. uh, and, and maintaining volume. And so, um, yes, no, no, I, I, I agree with you. I agree. I agree. Okay. Um, okay, so another question. Can you explain, oh, that's, uh, that's going to be a good one. Can you explain how to detect uh, hypertension, uh, pulmonary hypertension in an X ray? Like some yeah. peculiar sign of if present. I, I wanted to address that one because you can't. You can suspect it. Okay. The diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is an echocardiographic diagnosis. But what would you expect in a patient with pulmonary hypertension on a radiograph? You would expect right sided emphasis, so an enlargement of the right side of the heart. You would expect um, a bulge of the pulmonary artery, so that two to three, the, the one to two o'clock uh, um, bulge of the, of the pulmonary artery on a DV view. And you could potentially expect a distended caudal vena cava. So those three features would probably make you think that this needs an echo uh, and, and also an abnormal lung pattern. Of course, if you have a pulmonary thromboembolism, your lung pattern will be normal. But if you have a dog with a Westie with an alveolar interstitial pattern, yeah. that's going to be, and, yeah. and a big right side of the heart and a distended pulmonary artery, yeah. that's going to be a pulmonary interstitial fibrosis yeah, yeah. with pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. But, so... but the diagnosis is echo. Is it pulmonary hypertension internal medicine or cardiology? Internal medicine. <laughs> internal medicine treated and monitored by cardiology, but it is an internal medicine disease. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're just like digging at some Private more. Private joke. Some more. <laughs> That's right. it, it still continues to be funny. <laughs> still, still <today. laughs> Okay, so Guido, asking about narcolepsia, cataplexia. I've never mm. seen a case. Mm. Actually, I have a case that um, Anna from um, Ecuador sent me because I've never seen an, uh, a narcolepsia, cataplexia case in my, in my life. Um, okay, which is the more negative predictor of prognosis in a cardiogenic disease? Mm. The amount of mm. the time that the patient is unconscious during the syncope or the number of events uh, per week or per month? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. I, I think the time will be, will be what's going to make this patient uh, um, pass away. With regards to the, to the prognostic indicator, it, it, it depends on the, on, the, um, on the disease. Okay, so a VTAC, I can't cure, but I can make better maybe a little bit. A six sinus syndrome, I can cure with a pacemaker. A pericardial effusion that's idiopathic, I can cure with one tap. It may never come back. A pericardial effusion that is because of an hemangiosarcoma in the right atrium, there's nothing I can do. Pulmonary hypertension, if it is a, a thromboembolic event, I can maybe start treating it and make it better. Um, some id idiopathic pulmonary hypertension respond beautifully to sildenafil. I mean, a Westie with um, a pulmonary interstitial fibrosis, there's not a lot that you're going to do. So I think for the question, the, the thing that would worry me the most is how long the patient is hypoxic, because I think the underlying disease may kill it. For the prognostic indicator, the diagnosis will be and what you're able to offer. What you're, yeah. did, I hope I hopefully answer that question. I think it was Guido that, that did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, we have the last 10 minutes. So let's, should we do a little bit of uh, review? So tell us uh, what is the most common diseases uh, to collapse? Uh, what do you think that it could be a little bit taken with a neuro? How would you diagnose it? And it's true that we haven't talked about treatment. And then just said again about what would be the treatment uh, options. So, so give me the first one. So, uh, what most common most common uh, cause so, for me arrhythmias uh, in oh, my but, practice arrhythmias. But why don't you like why don't you do the what you say like the three groups that type of cardiac okay. disease that you can have yeah. the little cool. bit of a difference between between of them sure. because I like a lot sure. that you keep saying that with the tamponade. It is a little bit different to the others. Mm, 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 um, mm, mm. 
So, um, so yeah. They, yeah, we can review that. So for cardiac, we'll go arrhythmias, which could be tachycardia or could be bradycardia. So tachycardia is VTAC, will probably be more significant than, than uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, and bradycardia is uh, six sinus syndrome, so long periods of sinus arrest, which we can fix with a pacemaker, or third degree V block, which we can fix with a pacemaker. So for instance, a bradyarrhythmia, it's a very serious disease um, that patients present with a lot of collapsing, though they re but we can fix them with a pacemaker, uh, whilst the VTAC, we really can't. On the arrhythmias, the only thing that I would say is that any underlying disease will make sudden death uh, a big, big problem. And the, so if, if the patient has severe mitral valve disease, NAF, or uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, NAF, or VTAC, I mean, those patients will, will, will struggle. Um, and you would treat the arrhythmia, if you can, with a pacemaker, if it's a bradycardia, with drugs that slow the heart, if it is a tachycardia, and you'll try to improve cardiac output by controlling, obviously. Uh, can, I, can I ask you one question? Like, you when you have, you know, a lot of times we have also these kind of uh, random VPCs, and then it's sometimes cardio mm. is saying, oh, yeah, yeah, could be from like, another part of the, like another part of the body could be overlapped from like a neurological origin. Do you think that you could have um, arrhythmia affecting the heart from a non-pure cardiogenic disease that is going to be so severe than it's a pacemaker? It's, I know it's a very silly question, but I, I just came no, up no, to it's, no, no, it's not. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is a silly question at all. Um, an infiltrative cancer, an infiltrative tumor to the heart will cause a third gravy block, okay? We have seen lymphomas, we have seen yeah. carcinomas going to the heart, so those one will certainly, but like um, um, ventricular tachycardias will certainly be caused by non-cardiac disease, okay? So GDVs, uh, yeah. pancreatitis, peritonitis will cause the attacks, and we treat those. We treat, we're not afraid of treating those. Yeah. Um, if they are in the hospital in intensive care, and then we'll cut back once the, the underlying disease is sorted. So that will, for a pacemaker, I think it's a very, it, the pacemaker, normally it's an, a primary cardiac disease that's fixed by a pacemaker. If not, you will always try to fix the underlying disease. For instance, let's say hyperkalemia, an Addisonian crisis. It's going to cause a bradycardia, but I'm not going to put a pacemaker. I'm going to fix that Yeah, but, that, but that's, but that's mm. the thing that you're going to say, okay, look, the problem is not in the heart. So we really need to look. Yeah. We really, really yeah. need to look because otherwise, okay. Yeah, so if, it's, if I have a third degree uh, nature standstill with an, a hyperkalemia, there's no way I'm going to put a, a pacemaker and we'll, we'll, we'll address that first. Uh, I will only put a pacemaker if it's a primary cardiac disease. So that's arrhythmias, um, and that's how we treat it. Pericardial effusion, um, difficult uh, episode of the arrhythmia, they will be sudden, they will be flaccid normally, they can have that opistotonus that we've described, but they would recover quite promptly. Very if fast. not, the patient will have sudden death. Yeah. Pericardial effusion, um, presentation on physical examination, you would hopefully feel that you can't feel the heart very well, you can't listen to the heart very well. You're going to have distended jugular veins because the heart is being compressed with cardiac tamponade. Um, the episodes will last a lot longer and they can be mixed, okay? They take longer to, re to, to recover, yeah. they take longer to go down sometimes. Depends also on how the pericardial diffusion is formed. If it's one that's been there for weeks, um, you, you may notice it getting worse and worse. If it's a bleeding, uh, um, right edge of mandibular sarcoma is going to be like that, and it could be the last thing that the patient does. Treatment of that pericardial synthesis will obviously solve the problem immediately, and then the underlying disease will tell me what to do. Pulmonary hypertension, difficult diagnosis, um, very opistotonous on, on episode, mm. very inducible, very inducible. Excitement and exercise will consistently make that, that patient have the episode. Um, and um, the treatment, again, the underlying disease. So some, like pulmonary interstitial fibrosis, there's very little that you'll be able to save those lungs. Something like a, an idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Some respond very well to sildenafil. Uh, thromboembolism, I would look at the underlying disease and see if I can start clopidogrel, aspirin, and treat yeah. the underlying disease. Hopefully that, that, is that it? Is that what you want to call? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, th I, think, I think the ones that I'm confused with neurology, I'm confused with neurology all the time, so I don't know. <laughs> I think, I don't know, I agree with you that pulmonary hypertension probably is the one that, do you think we would be? Yeah, I think that oh. also the other ones, I'm just thinking the last ones, because mm. when, I mean, now I haven't uh, worked with Joao for three years, but when we were working together, we were like, obviously, like all the time talking about these cases. The ones that now sometimes Cardia sends me, we have had also some cases, the exercise induced collapse, you remember yes. the Labradors? But those That's guys right. remember that these, these kind of are, 
easy because it's like a young dog always happens when the weather is hot, hot, hot they start panting 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 they get a taxi and they collapse and they are collapsed yeah. for a while yeah. but it's yeah. true that those also now that all the vets know the disease we know it, it now that's we right. know we that's have right. the genetic right. test but yeah. it's true that those cases they could look very cardiac because it happens when it's hot they pant the temperature goes up uh, but they last also quite a long time and um, but I don't think that you will have any myasthenia coming to you, do you? No. It's, it's 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 rare just because he, no no I, th I think I think it is it is I think they come to you, and then and then so the the, the reverse PDA probably come to you because of myasthenia because the dog has the tendency to sit down. Um, ah, I don't think I don't, do yeah, 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 and yeah. Then, yeah yeah and then yeah and then yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we got it because because they don't have a murmur. A reverse PDA doesn't have a murmur. Okay, so, so maybe okay, so maybe I've I've missed a reverse PDA in my life because I don't think okay, shit. You haven't because they come back. You haven't because they come back, and they're they're very very rare. They're very rare. You haven't at all. Okay, so last question. I don't know if we're gonna have time. We really have three minutes. Why will pleural effusion mm. look blood tinged with no evidence of tumor within the heart of lung field? Why would be? Oh, I love that question. That is an awesome awesome question. Um, so, so that is actually one of my tests. I'm not sure if I'm going to have to talk about this, but um, if I have a pericardial effusion and I suspect, so I have a patient with pericardial effusion, uh, I suspect that it has a mass in the, in the, in the right atrium um, that's bleeding into the pericardium. And if I have a little bit of pleural effusion, I like to tap that pleural effusion first. If that pleural effusion is clear, it tells me that I, at least it's not bleeding from yeah. the lungs. If that... Pleural effusion is blood tinged. There has to be either coagulopathy associated with the process of DIC or that patient is bleeding also from metastasis in the lung. That's an awesome question. Awesome question. Okay. Yeah, we, you think you, that you didn't type? Yeah, yeah, no, you have a one. <laughs> did you see the counting down? One minute uh, 40. Okay, Joel, no, I haven't. thank you so much for no, being it's been great. there. Nice to catch up, actually. Yeah, thank you, guys. As always, we will record this. We have recorded this. We will, I will post it and then put it on YouTube so you can watch it. I know that some people were driving back home, so they were missing uh, some of the parts. So thank you we so used much. To have, we used to have these discussions when we're driving, we're driving from work back home.